when we put together the, the actual gallery space and decided what was going to be in the show, the then and now part of um, uh, the exhibit here, to me it was really important that we have this studio space because as an artist for me, when I would go visit another artist, uh, I always wanted to see where they worked. My space and you know my toys and my desk and everything, you know, I drew, drew on that desk for years and years and years and all the things in there that are my personal items and inspirations. So when you actually see this environment, you go, some guy, some person sits in here uh, in this space and, and does the stuff that we're now seeing on the walls. It makes this really interesting link right, uh, right. for people and they go, wow, a real person does this stuff. What's up guys? I'm Zach Norris with The Hundreds, here today at the San Diego Comic Art Gallery. We're here to interview Kevin Eastman, co-creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The Turtles are one of comic books' greatest independent successes. Not only that, but they crossed over into the world of TV, action figures, movies, books, so on and so forth with great success. We're going to be asking Kevin about the Turtles' lasting effects on pop culture, what it means to him and his legacy in comics, and what's next for him in the world of entertainment. Let's go check it out. How did you get linked up with Peter Laird, and how did Mirage become a thing? I found on a bus ride uh, home from the, to the grocery store that I was bagging groceries at, <clears throat> they had this magazine called SCAT, S-C-A-T. It was a, um, uh, had comic books in it and ads for local businesses and stuff. And, and so I gathered up my portfolio full of stuff, and I went over to Northampton. I showed up at the offices, and they were great. <clears throat> they said, well, you know, we don't, yours is more comic booky in style. We don't really do that kind of stuff. But, geez, you should meet this other local artist, um, a guy named Peter Laird. But they gave me his address. I wrote Peter a letter, he invited me to order his studio. I would pencil some comic pages or characters, and he'd do the same. And we'd trade him back and forth the next time we got together and ink each other's work. And we really liked the, the vibe and the energy and uh, of teaming up together. And that was Mirage Studios, and that's where, you know, the infamous late one night trying to make Pete laugh. I did the drawing, this drawing of what I called the next big thing. How does that turtle, that sketch, become the first comic book? It evolved for me thinking, as I was a huge fan of Bruce Lee, Fist of Fury, and Enter the Dragon, and all that stuff. And so I thought to myself, if Bruce Lee was an animal, what would be the, the absolutely silliest animal that Bruce Lee would be? And so that's where I did the sketch of. You know, Michelangelo, well, he then became Michelangelo, but it was a turtle with a mask on. He had nunchucks strapped to his arms from the, you know, the Bruce Lee influence. And that's where it was like, you know, haha, the next big thing. And we just looked at it and said, you know, this is, this is the dumbest thing we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> we get up the next day, we said, you know, let's just come up with a story that tells how these characters got to be the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We'll save some money and, and self-publish it. We don't have to get another rejection letter. We don't have to do anything, and just, let's just have fun with it. We want to draw comic books, let's just do it. This is some of the actual concept art that was done prior to the um, first issue actually being done. This was a really rough, rough I did before I did it into a final pencil sketch for Pete to ink of the very first turtle pose. What about this of Shredder? This looks, hmm? it's familiar. Mm -hmm. Initially, he only lasted one issue. That's right. Killed your main villain in the very first and book. We, and we swore we'd never bring him back. <laughs> but it's but, comics, though. Yeah, but it's comics. And, <laughs> and he was too cool a bad guy not to bring back this right, too much right, history. Right. People give you guys credit for the black and white boom. Mm -hmm. You know, Turtles was black and white for how many of the first issues? You know, all the way through to uh, City at War. The first uh, Mirage run ran through issue 62, um, and that was all black and white. Some of the first sketches of Casey, when I was developing Casey Jones for the uh, very first Raphael one-shot. Um, was that Casey's first appearance? Mm -hmm. I want to do a story that showed, had Raphael, you know, because he's our hothead, he's our character that's always sort of going off the deep end, if you will, and would it be interesting if he met somebody that was crazier than him? Would it help oh, him sort okay. of look inward a little bit? Right, tone it back um, a bit. Tone it back a little bit, so. By issue five, still using the ballpoint pen, but what's interesting about number five, and I want to put this up, because this was the actual first color cover of the Turtles. Okay. And also, it's, uh, the first issue we went from the larger format size to a, normal, um, comic to a normal comic book size. You come up with the idea for the Ninja Turtles, you, hey, we need to give these guys a backstory, do issue one, start to finish, just you two, sell out. Yeah, that was, um, it was, that was a real trip and, and quite a surprise. Um, when Dave Sim came out with Cerebus, um, that was kind of a, an early success of right in the middle. It wasn't an underground comic book, it was usually sex, drugs, and adults only humor. And these were sort of in the middle. It was like, you know, it wasn't Marvel or DC and it wasn't an underground comic, it was in the middle. Um, when we decided to self-publish, um, a couple comic fans bought it at some local stores and 
brought it to some convention and other dealers picked it up and it started, you know, just by word of mouth, um, we ended up selling out, um, you know, all, all 3,000 copies in a couple weeks. So we printed another 6,000, which was the second printing, and that was sold out as quickly. We sold 9,000 copies, which was, you know, it wasn't life-changing in any sense of the word, but it was a blast. But I always point to issue two of the Turtles as um, really the, the, the game changer in that Pete and I had this talk where he said, you know, after everything's paid and, and everything's done when we finish the book, we'll make about $2,000 each. We can pay our rent and we can draw comic books for a living. And if we do 60 of these a year, we can literally pay to become comic artists. So I quit, you know, all the other jobs I had and we started drawing full time. And then by the time we did issue three, 50,000 copies for issue three. So, and that was all happened, that was all in 1985. And we were, you know, then we just kept, you know, going up exponentially and we were just sort of like, holy shit, let's milk it for all, all, all it's worth and, and have right. a great time doing it. So come check out, this is the studio now. And what's cool about the space as it exists today is there's still stuff I had from that old studio and everything I've collected uh, in between, including some stuff that I, you know, had when I was a kid. There's comic book, there's magazines, there's articles, things that I read, things that I still read. Bruce Lee, of course. Yeah, Bruce Lee basically led to um, me penciling the first uh, uh, turtle you see here with the nunchuck strapped to his arm. This was a great character in the Turtles history, which I actually uh, like quite a lot. Um, a lot of fans don't, but it was Venus de Milo. This is a piece that I had sketched out and was working through into a finished painting, and I just haven't finished it yet. The first girl turtle, which actually, when we developed the show for Fox, originally it was going to be uh, a male turtle named Kirby, but Fox changed it up kind of at the last minute and wanted a female turtle, but I love Venus. Do you think one day there's going to be a page like this with contemporary artists that Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird will be on? Man, you never know. It's, um, you know, the 30 to 40 years that as these artists, you know, you the oldest, you know, with uh, Will Eisner, Jack Kirby, Harvey Kurtzman, um, you know, Bill Gaines, um, Stan Lee, of course, the people that brought it to this level, these are the, the giants that a lot of artists today, like myself, st stood on the shoulders of um, to get to sort of where we are now. So if, it, if it's the right place and the right time um, for, for someone to do another documentary featuring us new old guys, so, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, that would be an honor. When I'm not here any longer, my son will enjoy all this stuff. What is it like going from art studio to now we have this massive thing in the span of five, six years? By 1988, you know, the, the cartoon show had come out, um, the toys had come out, and so that sort of ramped everything up. I mean, even when the idea of the movie came in, we were pretty nervous about the movie because cartoons are one thing, toys are one thing, you know, comics are another thing, but to bring this to life in a live action movie was like, you know, that could easily look really cheesy and really bad, um, and that would be the end of it. When the f first movie came out, New Line of Gold of Harvest had hoped it would have some success or at least cover it. I think it was seven or eight million dollar cost. I think it did, ended up doing 135 million domestic when it came out. And uh, I've seen that it's the highest grossing independent film of its time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that propelled the whole business side and ratcheted it up even more because now suddenly it was wanted in lots of other countries and lots of other territories. And so the business side actually crept in even, even more. But, you know, it's a mixed blessing for sure in that, you know, the blessing is, um, there are characters, we own them, we control them, we receive the benefits of their success. But, um, you know, we didn't sleep much either. You know, it's like four hours a night because you were running a mini empire. Are you okay with the turtles being your legacy? No, oh, yeah, hell yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Kevin, we appreciate your time. Appreciate you walking us through explaining art to us, giving us the background, giving us the history. So this is a little bit of a, we talked about full circle. This is just that for me. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. No, it's, yep. I always say that, you know, we do lots of shows and conventions. We interact with lots of fans. And I always say to them when they say something, something awesome and nice like that, I always flip it back and say, well, I wouldn't have the coolest job on the planet if not for fans like you. So thank you. No worries. <laughs> Cheers. Appreciate it. Thank you.